Hello everybody, my name is Jay. I'm one of the expert OET teachers here at E2 Language. In this lesson, I'm going to give you some OET listening tips because some of those subtests can be pretty tricky. What we're going to do more specifically is I'll give you an overview of the listening subtests that will be very quick. Then we're going to think about the relationship between listening and reading because on test day you are faced not just with listening, but there's also reading that you have to do in multiple choice or in the listening part A subtest, for example. And what happens when you listen and read at the same time, or can you actually read and listen at the same time? So in other words, what's a good approach for each of these subtests? Because they're all quite different. Lastly, I'm going to give you a tip on how to improve your listening skills overall. So do stick around. But before we continue on, make sure you click that subscribe button if you're not yet a subscriber to this YouTube channel. We release really good content uh, nearly every week. So make sure you're the first person to receive that content. Click the subscribe button below. Okay, let me give you a quick overview of the listening subtests. So this is listening part A. You're going to hear a consultation between a health professional and a patient. It's a gap fill type of activity. It follows in sequence from top to bottom and you need to listen for synonyms and paraphrases and you need to put in single words or short phrases that are mentioned by the patient into the case notes here. That's how that one works. Listening part B is a series of multiple choice type questions and a short audio text that goes for like 30 or 40 seconds, okay? And there are three answer options for each. Listening part C is similar, but instead of having separate audios like in listening part B, you're going to listen to a longer monologue or a dialogue, uh, two people speaking or one person speaking. And this is where it starts to get really tricky because you're sort of listening and reading and anyway, let's have a little think about what you need to do when you're faced with that dilemma. So let's think about the relationship between listening and reading. Okay, in listening part A, it kind of works like this. So you hear a conversation between a health professional, in this case, a neurologist and a patient. And you're going to have the set of case notes where you need to fill in a word or a short phrase taken directly from what they say, or rather what the patient says in particular. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. So the neurologist says, do you mind if we start off by getting some background to your condition? So here you are oriented to the correct part of the case notes because it's used almost exactly the same language here, background to your condition and background to condition here, okay? But let's have a look at the, um, what the answer could be. Let's do some predictive analysis as to what sort of word needs to go in this gap. So experience discomfort and a something feeling in neck whilst driving. So we're looking for some sort of adjective here. So Kathy says, please call me Kathy. So um, until two years ago, my husband was in the army. We actually, we lived off base and I had a job which involved a lot of driving, right? Whenever I was in the car, I noticed that my neck would get pretty stiff at times. There's the nice adjective that you need to uh, put into this gap here. And what you've been doing is you're thinking about uh, keywords, of course, driving and car. And you're also thinking about synonyms or paraphrases. In other words, this word means the same thing as was hard to or discomfort, for example, experience discomfort and feeling. So you're sort of listening to what Kathy says and the word you're going to take directly. But in the meantime, this language here used in the case notes and the language used in the audio is different. Okay, so that's pretty tricky. If you do need help with that, or I recommend that you do some practice with this one, even though listening part A is the simplest subtest, I do recommend that you do some practice. Check out e2language.com. You can get a free full practice test, including listening part A there. So just sign up to that website. Cool. That's pretty easy. I'm not too worried about that one. Listening part B is where it starts to get a bit tricky, where the relationship between what you're reading on the paper in front of you and what you're listening to 
uh, is sort of distorted. So this is what listening part B looks like. Again, a multiple choice with three answer options and some text. Uh, so this is how it works. You get the context statement here that says, you hear a senior nurse talking about a new initiative that has been introduced on his ward. What problem was it intended to solve? Now you get 15 seconds here to read these answer options. So you get five seconds to spend reading each of these before you hear the ding, and then the speakers start to actually speak. And then when that's finished, you'll get five seconds, one, two, three, four, five, to make your selection before moving on to the next item, the next question. So it's pretty tightly timed there. The 15 seconds is certainly enough time to read over these. Um, now, let's do this. I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to read through this. So, you just I want you to get a feeling for how long 15 seconds is, right? So let's do this and then we'll actually answer the question together. So, question 27. You hear a senior nurse talking about a new initiative that has been introduced on his ward. What problem was it intended to solve? Okay, so you just got a feeling for how long 15 seconds goes for. And as you would have experienced then, it's enough time to re read each of those answer options. Now let's play around with this listening, reading, listening, reading relationship, because this is where you can get the right answer or not. So what I want you to do now is I'm going to read the actual audio script and we're going to do a little experiment. What I want you to do is to do this in a bad way. The bad way is I want you to read very carefully and listen very carefully at the same time. Okay, see if you can do this. One of our key priorities is improving communications between staff, patient and patient's families. We recently introduced a scheme called Dear Doctor, which involves giving each patient a card where they can make a note of any questions or concerns that they themselves have. They can also talk to their families during visiting time or even on the phone and see if there's anything else they'd like to add. The cards are then collected and given to the doctor before the ward round. We're really pleased with the response. Patients used to say they only thought of the things they felt they needed to discuss when it was too late. So the cards give them a better chance to bring up whatever's on their minds. In fact, it's been so successful that we're going to roll it out on all wards in the hospital. If you're like me and every other human being on the planet, you would have found it impossible, in fact, to be reading carefully and listening carefully at the same time because that part of the brain can only be used by one of those functions at one time. For example, you can only listen and then read. You can't do two at the same time. So this poses a dilemma when we're answering listening part B questions and there's a better way to do it. Let me show you what that way is. First of all, what you can do, if the wording is the same as the audio, you can read and listen if it's the same word. So read along with the narrator. So when the narrator says, you hear a senior nurse talking about a new initiative, you can read along because that'll actually reinforce what you're saying because what the narrator's saying and what you're reading are the same, okay? Then you've got the five seconds to read each answer option here. So the 15 seconds before the audio begins. Then what you wanna do is make sure that you've understood that question very uh, completely, and you can almost cover the answer options and just purely focus on listening, okay? That way, you're not going to be distracted by what you're reading and you're going to be listening very purely, if you like, and you're gonna get a full understanding without the distraction of the words in front of you, which take you away from that listening, okay? So that's gonna be an extremely helpful method for listening part B. Uh, okay, then you've got the five seconds before you have to move to the next question in which case you can quickly read and select the right answer. 
And because you've spent 15 seconds reading them before, they'll be somewhat familiar to you and you should be able to pick out the right answer. And the right answer for this one, by the way, was C. Hopefully you got that. So that's one type of method for listening part B, where you're doing this sort of, uh, you're not listening and reading at the same time, basically. When that audio starts, you're, you can almost cover it, just purely listen, and then quickly go, aha, C, okay? Then you've got listening part C. And this is where it gets a little bit uh, different. So let's do another experiment here. Unfortunately, with listening part C, you can't just cover over the answer options. Listening part C, the method's different. In listening part C, you need to do a little flicking type of, uh, what would you call it, technique. What I mean by a flicking technique is you are reading and listening, reading, then listening, reading, then listening, reading, then listening. You're flicking back and forth from the page in front of you to what you're hearing, going flickering like this and you'll quickly read the sentence and you'll be listening, then quickly read a sentence, then listen, quickly read a phrase, and then listen, etc. So let's practice this. So you've got two questions in front of you that you're about to see, and I'm going to be reading the transcript here, um, like it is on test day. And I just want you to practice sort of doing that flickering response between what I'm saying and what you're reading, and I want you to select the right answers. So this is a different technique. Let's try this one. Uh, first of all, let's just read the question prompt, actually. So what does Dr. J see as the main aim in his work? A, to inform patients about the different treatments on offer, to publicize the availability of tests for the condition, to raise awareness of the symptoms of the illness. 32, when Harry was offered a routine health check at his local surgery, he initially what? Resisted the idea due to his wife's experience, felt that he was too fit and well to be in need of it, or only agreed to attend because he's a doctor advised him to. Here we go. Now, before we get on to Harry, I'll give you a bit of background. Clearly my job covers many aspects of patient care, but what's the priority? Firstly, prostate cancer is in fact the most common cancer in men in the UK with over 40,000 new cases diagnosed every year. That's a staggering number. One problem is that this type of cancer actually develops very slowly, so there may be absolutely no sign that you have it for years. So if we're going to reduce the number of cases, it's vital that people like me get the word out to as many men as possible, that we tell them how to spot the signs of prostate cancer, like an increased need to urinate or straining while urinating. Unfortunately, the cancer can be in an advanced stage by the time patients come in for tests, at which point the available treatments are far less effective. So let me tell you a bit more about my patient, Harry. Like many middle-aged men, Harry was offered a routine health check at his local doctor's surgery. As far as he was concerned, he had no particular health problems or obvious symptoms at the time. And so he almost ignored the invitation, but he'd promised his family he'd look after himself. His wife had died of ovarian cancer some years before, so he felt obliged to go. It was during his appointment that, based on a few symptoms he mentioned, Harry's doctor decided that he'd need further investigation for prostate cancer and referred him to a specialist clinic at the hospital. So what was going on in your brain there and with your cognition? What you have to do, and there's no other way to do this because it keeps moving, keeps moving, not like listening part B when it stops, this one keeps going. And so what you're doing, as I mentioned, is flicking between listening, reading, listening, reading, reading for a little bit, listening, 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 reading, 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 listening. It's tough. This is really, I think this uh, listening subtest part C is, is a really tricky one. Again, do some practice at e2language.com. That will help you out. Cool. In fact, you can sign up for free. That includes live classes for OET um, as well. So do check that out. All right, let's just talk now about how to improve your listening skill in general. Okay, so what does it mean to become a better listener and to understand more, to comprehend more uh, than what you currently do? The key to improving your listening skill is actually by improving your understanding of how English is spoken, right? 
because it's how that person speaks that influences how you listen. So let's think about some of the features of spoken English. So in spoken English, there are 44 sounds, p, b, k, n, d, s, for example, these are the phonemes. The words, however, are connected. We do not speak like this. Like in all language, there's a thing called connected speech, which means that words are connected or glued together almost. It's contracted, which I'll show you what that means in a second. It has intonation, ups and downs. So when we rise for a question, for example, and go down at a full stop. In authentic speech, there are hesitations and uh, um, uh, ums and ahs. In OET, there are very few of these. It's not authentic speech. These are scripted items. Uh, regular speech, spoken speech, actually has grammatical errors. Native English speakers make a lot of grammatical errors. Words have stressed syllables. So you wouldn't say syllable, for example, you say syllable. So the first syllable is stressed. Function words are spoken rapidly. Words like in, on, at, the, of, for, and. These words are rapidly spoken. They're only, they only make a tiny little bit of sound. There's no emphasis on them. Content words, however, words like nouns, adjectives, and verbs are elongated or emphasized. And there are also various accents, of course. You might get British or American or Australian or Irish or whatever, and you might experience that in OET as well. So these are some of the features of spoken language. This is what we do when we speak. And of course, you're listening to all of these features coming in, the connections, the contractions, the word stress, the, the rapidly spoken uh, function words, for example. So let's have a look at that passage that I read before and have a think about this. So how does this work? So this is what I said. I said, one of our key priorities, or vow, or vow, or vow, here are some uh, function words that are rapidly spoken. One of our, vow, 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 split second, like 0 0.001 second here on vow. Key priorities emphasize, these are content words that are emphasized is improving, is improving, is improving. This is an, an example of connected speech. We don't say is improving, we say is improving, is improving. It's almost as if this is one word, is improving. Communications between staff, patients, and patients' families. We recently introduced a scheme called Dear Doctor, which involves giving each patient a card where they can make a note of any questions or concerns that they themselves have. They can also talk to their families during visiting time or even on the phone and see if there's anything else they'd like to add. The cards are then collected and given to the doctor, the doctor, the doctor. You can see how to the, to the, to the function words are rapidly spoken before the ward round. We're really pleased, here's some intonation. We're really pleased, you can hear it go up to signal uh, enthusiasm there. Really pleased with the response. Patients used to say they only thought of the things they felt they needed to discuss when it was too late. So the cards give them a better chance to bring up whatever's on their minds. In fact, it's been so successful that we're going to roll it out on all wards in the hospital. Now, also when I'm doing this, I'm using word stress here, successful, putting the emphasis here. Uh, I'm using sentence stress, so particular words get emphasized. All of those features that I just mentioned. I think the good thing about OET listening for you is that it's not authentic. And so some of those things you hear, like the contractions, are not actually in the text or in the audio there. So it makes it a little bit easier for you, which is good. Uh, cool, that's it. If you need some help with your more basic or fundamental English language skills, so not just test prep, but if you need to improve your pronunciation or vocabulary or grammar, go and sign up to e2school.com for free. It's a really cool platform that we've just built to help build your fundamental English language skills. Cool, that's all. Hope that was helpful. Gives you some insight into the OET listening subtest and some of the tips that you can use to help you. Uh, but again, it's all about practice, good quality materials, live classes, everything you need is at e2language.com. My name is Jay, I'll see you soon.